Welcome to the Voice of Triumph. My name is Ugochuk Igbazo. Um, it's a beautiful Sunday morning, and I'm sure God has a word for you and your family. Let's go right into the word of God. Hallelujah. Today we're looking at the second part in the series that I titled um, The Things That Accompany Salvation. The Things That Accompany Salvation. This is the second part. And of course, our anchor story or anchor scripture is a story of the prodigal son that you all know very well in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 24. But let me begin from um, verse 20 this time. You know the story? The prodigal son got part of his father's wealth, went to a distant land, spent everything, and then eventually came back to his senses, returned home to his father. And look at verse 20. The Bible says, I'm reading the New Living Translation. It says, so he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming, filled with love and compassion. He ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. Praise God. 21, his son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Verse 22, but his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. The first thing he got was the robe. And then secondly, get a ring for his finger. The second thing he got was a ring. And then sandals for his feet. The third thing he got when he got back, when he returned home, were a pair of sandals. Verse 23. And kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. Hallelujah. 24. For this son of mine was dead, and now is returned to life. He was lost, but now he's found. So the party began. The party began. So this is an anchor scripture. This is an anchor story. Um, in the first part of this series, we established that the, when, the, when the prodigal son got back, home, got back home, he got a rope, he got a ring, he got a pair of shoes. And we said that each of these things represent the things that you and I got from God when we got born again, when we were reconciled to him. Each of these things represent the, the things that were given to us by God. Um, you know, very, very often when we talk about salvation, the only thing we talk about is the forgiveness of sins. And when that's the only picture we have, um, we, are, we are limited in our Christian experience. It is also important that we recognize that apart from being delivered from sins, um, we were given wonderful things in Christ. God gave us wonderful gifts. Amen. And those are the things that the rope, the ring, and the, the sandals represent. And in the first part of the study, we began to look at what the rope means. And we saw that for you and I, the rope means, the rope is a symbol of the righteousness that we got from God our Father that when we got born again, God actually gave us his very own righteousness. And we looked at two scriptures clearly, Romans chapter 5, verse 17, that says that if by one man's sin, um, death reigned to all men, how much more those who have received the abundance of grace of, of the gift of righteousness reign in this life through one man, Jesus Christ. So there we see that we received the gift of righteousness, which is what the robe represents. We also saw the scripture in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, where God says, that he made Jesus to become sin for us, who knew no sin, so that you and I might become the righteousness of God in him. Again, we see the robe represents the righteousness that we got from God. Today, we want to see another thing that the robe represents, or another thing that the robe symbolizes, that was given to you and I when we got born again, which is royalty. So the robe is a symbol of royalty, praise God. Did you know that, that when you got born again, royalty was conferred on you god gave you royalty so you must begin to think like royalty praise god hallelujah so the robe is also a symbol of royalty and i'm going to be reading out a number of things that i wrote here i like to read this thing so i don't miss out on anything so let's go let's begin with our anchor scripture we read it luke chapter 15 verses 11 to 24 new living translation and then look at what I have written here. He said, our focus in this study is the robe as a symbol of royalty. Amen? Several scriptures attest to the fact that the robe means royalty. Let's look at them. John 19, verses 1 to 3, the story of our Lord Jesus Christ shortly before his crucifixion. John chapter 19, verses 1 to 3. We want to see how the robe signifies royalty. Hallelujah. Amen. Look at this. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers, the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe, a robe, amen, and said, look at what the robe means, hail king of the Jews, royalty, 
king of the Jews, and they smote him with their hands. So we see that, you know, as soon as they put the robe on Jesus Christ, they were actually, you know, declaring that he was a king. They called him the king of the Jews because the robe is a symbol of royalty. Praise God that you and I got when we got born again. Now let's look at the covenant between Jonathan, Saul's son, and David. Amen. Again, we see the robe signify royalty in that covenant. First Samuel 11, 18, verse 3 and 4. First Samuel 18, verse 3 and 4. Look at it. We see the robe again as a symbol of royalty. Amen. He said, then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword and to his bow and to his girdle. Remember, shortly before Jonathan did this, Jonathan had actually told David that he knows that David was eventually going to be king of the Jews or king over Israel. So Jonathan was actually signifying what he had said or was actually um, um, actually buttressing what he had said by you know, giving David a robe as a symbol of the fact that David was going to be king over Israel. So we see the robe as a symbol of royalty in these two scriptures. Amen? So let me read this again that I have written. As soon as the prodigal son got reconciled to his father, he received a robe amongst other things. Amen? And we saw that in our previous studies. Amen? So the robe symbolizes the fact that we received royalty the moment we got saved. It symbolizes the fact that we received royalty the moment we got saved. How do we know that we received royalty or we were made kings or we got royalty when we got saved? The Bible is very clear about it. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Look at what it says. First Peter 2, 9. Hallelujah. I like to read it. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Look at what it says. He said, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. So we are we are royalty in Christ. We got it from our Father. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show for the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So God gave us royalty the moment we got born again. We became kings. Hallelujah. You're going to have this. What this means is that you and I have been made kings unto God. That's what it means. Amen. The robe as a symbol of royalty that we got from God means that we have been made kings unto God in Christ Jesus. The moment you got born again, God made you a king. Hallelujah. Praise God. Look at the Bible in Revelation 1, 6. Let's look at Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Verse 6, and this is our interest here, and has made us kings and priests, unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So Jesus Christ has made us kings, royalty, unto God our Father. Hallelujah. Unto God our Father. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So I have this written here. Because Jesus is our king, and we have become partakers of his royalty, he is therefore the king of kings. Because we are kings, and Jesus is our king. That's why Jesus is called the King of Kings. Praise God, because we got royalty from our, our Father through Jesus Christ. The moment we got born again, we became kings. First Timothy chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, establishes the fact that Jesus is now the King of Kings, because we're kings, and he's our king. Hallelujah. First Timothy chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. Look at it. Chapter 6, verse 14 and 15. Hallelujah. He said that you keep this commandment, amen, without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show, who is the blessed and the only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So Jesus is our king, and because we're kings, now that we're born again, he is called the King of kings. Kings, hallelujah. Again, Revelation 19, verses 11 to 16. Revelation 19, verse, again, establishes this fact. Verse, chapter 19, verses 11 down to 16. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon the horse was called Faithful and True, 
and in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but himself, talking about Jesus, and he was clothed with you know, a, a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Verse 15, and out of his mouth quit a sharp sword, that with it he might smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treaded the winepress of the fierceness and rod of the Almighty God. Verse 16, and he had on his vesture and on his tie a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Praise God. So we are kings. And that's what the robe signifies. And because Jesus is our king, he's called the king of kings. So we must begin to think like kings. We must begin to think and act like royalty. That's what God is saying to us. Praise God. Hallelujah. So we've established that the robe also, apart from you know, meaning the righteousness we got from God, that the robe is also a symbol of the royalty that we got from God. Because now in Christ we have become kings. Now, God does not do anything without a purpose. Neither does he do anything without an expectation. If God has given us royalty as a robe, if God has made us kings because we're born again, because we're in Christ, God has an, an expectation, or God has expectations. There, there are reasons why God did it. He has expectations from you and I now that we're kings. So we want to look at what God expects from you and I now that we're king, so how God expects you and I to live, to relate with him, and to relate with the world around us now that we're kings, now that we're royalty. So the question is, what does God expect from us as kings? What does he expect from us as royalty? Number one, God expects you and I to begin to reign. If you're born again, you're royalty, you're a king, the first thing that God expects from you and I is to begin to reign, amen, to begin to reign. And I have that written here. Praise God. He says, our calling as kings is to reign over the devil and the circumstances of this life. To reign. It's our calling as kings, as royalty. To begin to reign over demons, over the devil, and over the circumstances of this life. Amen? And we see that clearly in Revelation 5, verses 8 to 10. Clearly reveals the fact that as kings, God expects you and I to reign. Praise God. Revelation chapter 5 verses 8 to 10. Look at it. Revelation 5, verses 8 to, to, to 10. Look at what it says. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of orders. And these orders are the prayers of saints. Verse 9. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou was slain, and has redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every kindred and out of every tongue, and people and nations, verse 10, and has made us unto our God kings, royalty, why? And we shall reign on earth. So God expects you and I to begin to reign as kings, praise God, to begin to reign as kings. And that's what this whole teaching is about. Amen? To begin to reign as kings. Now I have this written also in Psalm 110, verse 1 and 2. Let's read Psalm 110, verses 1 and 2. Psalm 110, verses 1 and 2. A Psalm of David. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion, Rule thou in the midst of your enemies. Again, this scripture establishes the fact that we're called to rule and to reign as kings. This is God's expectation for you and I who are kings, who are royalty, to rule even in the midst of our enemies. You know, sometimes we may imagine that, you know, God will need to kill our enemies before we rule or we reign. Um, some of us have been told, even by preaching and by things that are meant to be words of knowledge or words of wisdom or prophecies, that if certain enemies of yours don't die, you can't reign, you can't advance, you can't succeed. That's really not the way God operates. He doesn't need to kill your enemies before you succeed. 
He doesn't need to kill your enemies before you can rise in life. He doesn't need for your enemies to die before you can make progress in life. The beauty is for your enemies to be alive while you rule, while you reign, because truly, think about it. If all the enemies are dead, who will be ruling or reigning over who? I mean, if you're a believer, I'm a believer. You can't reign over me. You can't rule over me. So the, the beauty of, you know, kings that we are as children of God is to rule and reign even in the midst of our enemies, to excel and succeed and be fulfilling the will and the plan of God for our lives, even in the presence of our enemies. The Bible says that God has prepared a table for us in the presence of our enemies. That's the beauty of God. He doesn't want you feasting when your enemies are dead. He wants you feasting in the presence of your enemies. Praise God. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. So anybody who tells you that you can't succeed until somebody dies, that is not the character of God. Amen. God doesn't need for them to die for you to succeed. He wants you to succeed while they watch you. He wants you to succeed while they look at you, while they spectate and watch you go from glory to glory. That will be your portion in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So we are called to reign. God expects you and I to reign as kings. Amen? To reign as kings. And the good news is that we have been empowered by the two things we need to reign. Because you might be listening to this message and wondering, do I really have what it takes to reign? You do. God has, has empowered you and I has given us you and you have given you and I what we need to reign. We don't lack the ability to reign. You see, if we're not reigning, it's um, for two of, you know, either of two reasons. If you and I are not reigning, it's for either of two reasons. Number one, either as a result of ignorance, or number two, as a result of the lack of will, not for the lack of ability. The church has never had a problem with the lack of ability. The problem with the church is either ignorance or lack of will. We're not just willing to exercise, exercise who we are or exercise what we have. That's the truth. Amen? God has given us the two very important things we need to reign. Praise God. And you find that in Romans chapter 5 verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they who have received abundance of grace, number one, and of the gift of righteousness, number two, shall reign in this life by one Christ Jesus. And that's what I have here. The good news is that we have been empowered by the two things we need to reign. First, the grace of God, his wisdom, his ability. We have it already. That's what grace is. We have received an abundance of God's ability, an abundance of God's wisdom because we need it to reign. It's no longer a promise for you and I. It's a reality if you're born again. The Bible says you have already received an abundance of grace, God's wisdom, God's ability to enable you to reign, reign over satanic forces, reign over the challenges of this life. Amen? Praise God. Let's look at one scripture that establishes it. Proverbs 8, verses 12 to 15. Praise look at God. It. So let's read verse 12 of Proverbs chapter, um, chapter 8, verse 12. Look at what it says. It says, I wisdom. We're trying to establish the fact that um, not only do we need the wisdom of God to reign, but we already have the wisdom of God in Christ to reign. If you're born again, you already have the wisdom of God to reign. It's no longer a promise for you. Amen? Look at verse 12. It says, I wisdom dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. Amen? Now look at the connection between wisdom and reigning. Look at verse 15. It says, wisdom. Wisdom says, by me kings reign. Remember, we're kings. We're royalty in Christ Jesus. God gave it to us in Christ Jesus. The moment we got born again. He says, by me kings reign and princes decree justice. Now you may read the scripture and say, well, do I really have the wisdom to reign? Yes, you do. If you're born again, you have the wisdom to reign. And I'll show you right now. It's no longer a promise. If you're born again, the wisdom of God is no longer a promise for you. It's your reality. You have the wisdom you need as a king to reign and to decree justice. First Corinthians chapter 1 verse 30. Look at it. It establishes the fact that you have the wisdom. I have the wisdom we need to reign if we're born again. Look at what the Bible says. It says, but of him are you in Christ, of God. If you're born again, are you in Christ? Who of God, hallelujah, is made unto us, not will be. Jesus has already been made unto us. Wisdom, praise God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. 
So if you are born again, Christ in you is the wisdom of God. The wisdom you need to reign as a king is Christ in you. You already have it. The Bible says, of God are we in Christ, who has been made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. You know, I ask a question. If, if, if you're born again, you know you are the righteousness of God. So why don't you pray for righteousness? Because you know you have it. We established that as a role. You've been given the righteousness of God in Christ. So you don't go to God and say, Lord, give me righteousness. You know that's who you are. And the Bible says, not only have you been made righteousness in Christ. The Bible says, Jesus has also been made your wisdom. Praise God. The wisdom you need to reign is Jesus in you. So if you don't pray for righteousness, why then do you pray for wisdom? Because Jesus has been made both of them to you. He's been made righteousness to you. You don't pray for it, you know you have it. He's also been made wisdom to you if you're born again. You don't pray for it, you know you have it. You know, sometimes people go to God to beg for wisdom. No, you acknowledge what you have. You acknowledge that you have the wisdom of God you need to reign. That's how you put this wisdom to work for you. Philemon chapter 1 verse 6, let's see it. Philemon 1 6, it says, it says that the communication of your faith might be effectual. How? By the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. So how do you get the wisdom of God in you to work for you, to empower you to reign? By acknowledging that you have the wisdom of God. That Jesus has been made unto you the wisdom of God. Praise God. So you have the wisdom you need to reign as a king. You don't like it. You acknowledge it and it begins to work for you. Praise God. And to put you over in the affairs of this life. To empower you to reign over sickness and disease and the circumstances of this life. You acknowledge it. It works for you. When you don't acknowledge the wisdom of God in you, it doesn't work for you. Praise God. And that's the way it is of, you know, with every other gift that you and I have received from God in Christ Jesus. The more you acknowledge what you've been given, the more you declare that you have what God has given you, the more you activate it to work for you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, the second thing we have been given to reign, we have been empowered with to reign from Romans 5, 17, is the gift of righteousness. And how is the gift of righteousness, right standing with God, approval from God? How is it meant to enable you and I to reign? How does it help you and I to reign as kings? It inspires boldness. That's what the Bible says. Amen? The more you know that you received approval from God as a gift, irrespective of your weaknesses and your shortcomings, what does he do? He empowers you with the boldness you need to reign. Praise God. He empowers you with the boldness you need to reign. Because, you see, one of the ways that the enemy actually dampens the believer's ability to reign is to always, you know, point out your weaknesses to you. Every time you want to reign, you, you want to exercise, you know, your, your power and your authority as a king, the enemy reminds you of all the weaknesses you have. And then he begins to tell you of all the mess you've been through in your life. He even reminds you of all the wrong things you've been doing. What is he trying to do? He's trying to take you away from righteousness consciousness into sin and weakness consciousness because he knows that the more conscious you become of your weaknesses, and your wrongdoings and all of your shortcomings, then the, the more difficult it is, it is for you to reign because that affects your boldness. Amen? The, 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 the more you can exercise boldness. That's what it does. Amen? So every time he wants you to remember the things you've done wrong, every time he wants you to remember your weaknesses and your shortcomings, because he knows that none of those things can inspire boldness in you to be able to reign over the affairs of life, amen? But when you realize that you are the righteousness of God in Christ and that you've gained approval from God, not by your works, but because of the obedience of Jesus Christ, of course, the bolder you become, not only towards God your Father, but the bolder you become, you know, in, in reigning towards the affairs of this life, towards the challenges and all the things that you and I, we confront every day in this life. Praise God. So righteousness inspires boldness. That's why God has given us grace and righteousness to be able to reign. Proverbs 28 verse 1. It says, the wicked will flee when no man pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Why? 
because the righteous knows that they've gained the approval of God irrespective of their weaknesses or their shortcomings or the things they are dealing with. They have approval from God as a gift because of Jesus Christ. So they are bold. When they come to God, they are bold. When they address the challenges of life, they are bold. When they confront the issues of life, they are bold. Praise God. So we have received the two things we need to win. Remember, the abundance of grace, God's wisdom and ability, and of the gift of righteousness. Hallelujah. So we've seen the first thing that God expects from you and I as kings to reign. Now the second thing that God expects from you and I as kings is to have power in our words. This is huge and this is very, very important. As a king, God expects you and I to have power in our words. Kings don't speak empty words. Kings speak words. Kings speak words with power. I mean, think about it. In a territory or in a community, when a king speaks, that is final. Because even the king himself knows that once the word has come out from him, the word has power. That is the consciousness that God wants you and I to live life with. Are you listening to me? As kings, if you're born again, that's the consciousness that God expects you and I to live with. The consciousness of power in our words. So God expects you and I, praise God, to have power in the words we speak. As kings, as royalty. Hallelujah. Remember, the robe is a symbol of royalty that we got from God the moment we got born again. So God expects you and I, as kings, to have power in our words. Let's look at the scripture that explains it. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 4. Praise God. Ecclesiastes 8 4. Look at what it says. It says, where the word of a king is, there is power. Hmm. Hallelujah. This is good, isn't it? It says, where the words of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, what doest thou? Who may say unto him, what doest, what doest thou? Amen? I like the message translation. He says the king has the last word. Amen? You know what it means? So doctors may give you a report, but that is not the final report. They don't have the final report. You know, the economy in your country may be giving a report. The government of your country or your state may be giving a report, but they do not have the final report. You actually, by the word of God in your mouth, actually you have the final report. You see, no matter what anybody says about your destiny, until you say it, it doesn't come to pass. It is not what anybody says about your future that becomes your future. It is not what any government says about your tomorrow that becomes your tomorrow. It is not what any uncle or aunt, it doesn't matter who they are, says about your tomorrow that becomes your tomorrow. It is what you say about your tomorrow that is the final word. That's what the message translation says. It says the king has the last word. That is a huge responsibility as a king. Praise God. You have the final word. It is not about what anybody says. It is about what you say. Amen? So that's why God expects you and I to have power in our words. When you speak as a king, expect your words to come to pass. Expect your words to carry authority. Amen? Expect your words to have power. Because God has given you royalty. Hallelujah. I have this written here. As kings, we must begin to expect our words to command power and authority. To command power and authority. Hallelujah. This is huge and this is good. Because now you understand that as a king, you actually define the outcomes of your life. Not anybody. Not your government. It doesn't matter what anybody says. It, what matters is what you say. What you say, praise God. Because where the word of a king is, there is power. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, the third expectation that God has from you and I as kings, or the third thing that God expects from you and I as kings, is to establish righteousness and judgment. Amen? It is the duty of kings and role of kings to establish righteousness and judgment. And that's what God expects from you and I as royalty as men and women that he has made kings, hallelujah, giving royalty in Christ Jesus. Amen. Remember the robe is a symbol of royalty. So God expects you and I to establish righteousness and judgment. I have this written as well. What this means is that as kings, 
We can't promote compromise, listen, and wrongdoing. No, as kings, God expects us to establish righteousness and judgment. And I have it written here that as kings, we can't promote compromise and wrongdoing. It is an aberration. I mean, think about it. The role of a king in a community or a kingdom is to ensure that people do right, to ensure that people obey the rules, obey the laws of the kingdom. That is the role. The king is the sole, um, is, is the, how can I put it? The king is the highest authority with the responsibility to establish the laws of the land to ensure compliance to the laws of the land, to ensure that people do what is right, because he knows that if he doesn't enforce right in his kingdom, if he doesn't enforce obedience and compliance in his kingdom, very soon he won't have a kingdom. Because where there are no laws, where people are not taught to do what is right, there's chaos. So it is the primary responsibility of the king to ensure that righteousness is established wherever they are, in the kingdom, in the community. And that's the message that God has for you and I today. That as men and women that have been given royalty, God expects that wherever we are, praise God, people should not be comfortable in wrongdoing, wherever we are. People shouldn't be comfortable in disobedience and lawlessness because we're kings. It's our duty to establish right doing, to establish righteousness, to establish, establish, you know, judgment wherever we are. Praise God, by the way we speak, by the conducts of our lives, people should not be at home with compromise around us. People shouldn't be comfortable in compromise around us. Praise God. That's what God is saying here. Amen. So let me read this again. What this means is that as kings, we can't promote compromise and wrongdoing. Rather, our lives and conduct must always inspire righteousness, must always inspire righteousness. It's an aberration for people to feel comfortable in their wrongdoing around us. Wow, this is huge. And this is what I have written here. It's an aberration when people feel comfortable in wrongdoing around us, whether in your office, in the marketplace, in your business places. It should be that when you show up, everybody starts to arrange themselves. That's what it should be. That when you show up, even if people had been in wrongdoing, they start to correct themselves. They start to reorganize themselves. Why? Because you're a king. There's a kingly anointing upon your life. Amen? That shouldn't make people be comfortable in compromise around you. So it's an aberration when you and I, who should establish righteousness, are the ones promoting unrighteousness, are the ones promoting wrongdoing, you know, by the way we live, or even the messages that we send, it's an aberration. Praise God. Hallelujah. Proverbs 16, verse 12. Look at what the Bible says here. Proverbs 16, verse 12. So God expects you and I as kings to establish righteousness and judgment. Look at it. Amen. It is an abomination for kings to commit wickedness. That's what God says. What is wickedness? Wickedness is anything that is done contrary to the word of God. Wickedness is living contrary to the word of God. So unrighteousness and wickedness, wrongdoing and wickedness actually mean the same thing. You see, it's an abomination, an aberration for kings to commit wickedness or promote wickedness. For the throne is established by righteousness, by right doing. So it is the role of a king to establish right doing, right living and not to compromise or to create an atmosphere that promotes compromise. It's an abomination. It's an aberration when that is coming from you and I who are kings. Hallelujah. Amen. So I guess we'll stop here for today. In our next study, we'll be looking at other things that God expects from you and I as kings, as men and women that he has given royalty as a role in Christ Jesus. Praise God. So I want you to begin today by living with this consciousness. Remember, if we recap a bit, we began to establish in the beginning that the role is a symbol not only of righteousness, but a symbol of the royalty that we receive we got from God when we got born again. And we began to see how we are kings. And because Jesus is our king, Jesus is called the king of kings. And then we began to see that we've received 
We have what it takes to reign. Amen? Because God expects us to reign. We have, we have the abundance of grace, God's wisdom and ability, and we have the gift of righteousness, God's approval to inspire boldness so we can reign. We also saw that God also expects us, apart from reigning, God expects you and I to do what? To have power in our words. As kings, we don't speak empty words. When we speak, we expect our words to come to pass. Practice power in your words. Amen. And then thirdly, we establish that as kings, God expects you and I to establish righteousness, right doing, lawfulness, and not to promote compromise and lawlessness, and to establish judgment. Praise God. When we meet again, we'll continue in this series. Um, but I do not want to close you know, the, 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 the broadcast today without giving someone an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of their lives. Maybe that's why you tune in in the first place. You want to surrender your life to him. Can you say this after me? Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart. You died for me. On the third day, God raised you from the dead. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. I am born again on my way to heaven. Now I'm a king. Praise God. I'm a king in Christ Jesus. I have royalty. I'm called to reign. I'm called to have power in my words. I'm called to establish righteousness and judgment. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, should you want us to pray for you? Amen. Or should you want to share a testimony of the impact of this broadcast on your life or family? Please be free to call any of the numbers on the screen. I will be glad to get back to you. Till we meet again, keep walking in the royal mentality. You are not ordinary. You are a king if you are born again. And God expects you to reign, have power in your words, and establish righteousness and judgment. I love you. Bye-bye. Thank you.